Welcome to AP Chemistry at Hananiga High School. I'm Brian Brown and today we'll be looking at our third and final chapter relating to the atom. So we're going to get into some nuclear chemistry over the next three set of notes. Now in the beginning of chapter 21 we're setting up the basic idea behind the nucleus and stability in the nucleus and how atoms who are unstable can fix that instability. So first off, the nucleus. Remember in our symbol notation, we've got the mass number in the upper left-hand corner, atomic number in the lower left, and we write the symbol. Remember, the nucleus comprised of two particles. Now, particles in the nucleus we refer to as nucleons. So protons and neutrons are example of nucleons. And the number of protons is our atomic number. The number of protons and neutrons together is the mass number of the atom but it's effectively our mass because electrons weigh so little. So fundamentally when we see the mass number, we're often looking at what we roughly call the mass of the atom. And remember, mass number would be a count of how many nucleons we have. Now, isotopes. Not all atoms of the same element have the same mass due to different numbers of neutrons in those atoms. And this is something that was actually discovered by Thompson. And what he realized was that not all atoms of fluorine looked exactly the same. Some of them weighed differently. Chemically, they were identical. And later we knew that's because they have the same number of protons and electrons. But physically, they were a little bit different. And that was because they can have a different number of neutrons inside the atom. So there's four naturally occurring isotopes of something like uranium. Uranium-234, 235, and U-238. So all of these have a slightly different number of neutrons in the nucleus or mass number. So in hyphen notation, we write the mass number to describe exactly which isotope we're talking about. Now, section 21.1 gets into radioactivity, and radioactivity is um, looking at when we have an unstable nucleus, and the unstable nucleus is spontaneously breaking apart to become more stable and releasing ionizing radiation. So radioactive is a dangerous type of radiation. To radiate or to have radiation, well, light is a form of radiation, but radioactivity, now we're looking at ionizing radiation. Now, a nucleus with a specific number of protons and neutrons is known as a nuclide. So we're talking about a specific isotope. We refer to it also as a nuclide. It's not uncommon for some nuclides of an element to be unstable or radioactive. So if you have a physically unstable nucleus, then that nucleus will undergo nuclear reactions to achieve stability and release radiation. And we often refer to these radioactive nuclides as radionuclides. Now there are several ways radionuclides can decay into different nuclides. Now keep in mind, while it releases ion or ionizing radiation when this happens, this is a normal process for a number of different isotopes that actually happen to be in your body at this particular time. So this is a normal process that happens in the world around us. And there are actually a number of different scientific uses of some of these radionuclides. Now, next section gets into stability. So we're going to start by looking at when you are stable and what can cause you not to be stable, and then how an atom can undergo different nuclear reactions to try and become more stable. Stable. Now, an element with more, more than one proton, so anything but hydrogen, is going to have repulsions between the protons. And remember, by Coulomb's law, when you have things that are very close together, and it doesn't get much more close together than cran the nucleus, they're going to be very, very strong forces. So we're looking at very strong forces of repulsion that occur inside a nucleus. And this can cause nucleuses to be unstable. And we refer, refer to this as the strong nuclear force. Uh, or I should say, in order to overcome those repulsions and hold particles together in the nucleus, we need a very strong force to overcome those very strong repulsions and refer to this as the strong nuclear force. And it helps keep our nucleus from flying apart. Remember, those repulsions are pushing very strongly to try and push that nucleus apart. And the strong nuclear force is what holds those things together. Later on, we'll look at where that comes from. Now, neutrons play a key role in stabilizing the nucleus by helping to reduce the proton-to-proton -proton repulsion. Remember last chapter, getting into electron-electron repulsion and significance? In our nucleus, it's all about the proton-proton repulsion. And neutrons, as neutrally charged particles, help add separation between our protons. So neutrons have a stabilizing effect on the nucleus. 
So therefore, the ratio of neutrons to protons is a really important factor when we're looking at stability of nucleuses. Now, for smaller nuclei, atomic number under 20, remember that's what Z stands for, the stable nuclei will have a neutron to neutron ratio of pretty close to one. So notice this red line here on our graph is our one to one line. Well, at the beginning, it seems like most of our stable nuclei are right around that one to one area. Now, as nuclei get larger, and that's when we have more protons in there, we need a greater number of neutrons to help overcome those very strong repulsions that are happening. So now you'll notice we have a greater neutron to proton ratio than one. That's because we need more neutrons to protons to stabilize the nucleus if we want to have any hope of making a stable nuclide. Now, in this picture is the shaded region that's often referred to as the belt of stability. And that really shows what nuclides will be stable. And at the same atomic number, you can have several stable nuclides as long as they're within that band. Get outside of that band and you are going to be unstable. So, nuclei above that belt really have too many neutrons to be stable. They tend to decay by doing beta particle emission. So we're going to talk about a beta decay in a little bit. So beta decay can help fix too many neutrons. Now, below the belt of stability, we have too many protons. And there's a couple of different decays that can help with that. Positron emission and electron capture are both ways to basically get our neutron to proton ratio back to the belt of stability. In other words, get rid of some protons or convert protons into neutrons and bring our ratio back into the belt of stability. Now, if you have a large atom, eventually there's just no way to stay stable. You have too many protons, and you can't end up with a stabilizing effect with neutrons. So literally anything greater than 83 just has too many protons for neutrons to stabilize them, and they are all unstable. So you've got a very large atom. We basically need to shed nuclear mass to become stable, and that's a different type of radioactive process. So what are the types of processes, radioactive decays, that can get us back in the belt of stability? Well, first is the alpha decay, and that's when you basically have something larger than 83. You're just too big. You will often undergo alpha decays to become stable. And it basically is a release of an alpha particle, which is a stripped helium nucleus, from the nucleus of the atom. So it's 4 over 2 He, and it's actually a positively charged particle. So we don't show the plus 2 here, but it is a stripped helium nucleus. So if you notice, uranium-238 can become thorium-234, and that's making the atom significantly smaller. Our nucleus is getting smaller in this case, so our mass number drops significantly. So shedding mass, the best way to do that is with alpha decay. Now, at this point, I want to point out something that you probably saw last year in pre-A chemistry, but I'm not sure how much longer we're going to be getting into nuclear chemistry in pre-A P. So I want to make sure I point it out here. It's not hard, but you need to understand balancing nuclear reactions is a little bit different than balancing regular reactions. What we have to do is make sure our total mass number equal, and 238 in the left, 234 and 4 in the right, yes, they balance, and our total atomic number balances. So 92 on the left, 90 plus 2 is 92 on the right. This would be a balanced nuclear reaction. So when we're balancing nuclear reactions, it's all about balancing the atomic numbers total on the left and right, and balancing the mass numbers total on the left and the right. So if we had a missing particle, like we did not know that that was an alpha particle, so this was some mystery unknown particle, you would say, okay, wait, 238, 234 plus what is 238? It's going to be 4. 90 plus what equals 92? It's going to be 2. And then I can look up in the periodic table. What has atomic number 2? Oh, helium does. That's my alpha particle. So remember, in balancing nuclear reactions, the total number of protons and neutrons before and after have to end up equaling, which means we need to balance our mass numbers and our atomic numbers. Now, next type of decay is beta decay. And this is the loss of a high-speed or high-energy electron. So a beta particle, which is shown by these two symbols here, either one you can use. I typically use this one because it's a little more descriptive. Remember, it's a high-speed, high-energy electron. And what's really happening inside the nucleus is a neutron is being converted to a proton. And that's why it helps solve the problem of too many neutrons. So a neutron is converted to a proton, and that brings our ratio back into the belt of stability. 
And what we end up doing is ejecting a high-speed electron from the nucleus. So that's why one of our products here is 0 over negative 1e. And remember, what's on top and what's on bottom left and right have to equal. So 131 plus 0 does equal 131. And 54 plus what would equal 53? Well, it's got to be a negative 1. So remember, if you ever see a negative 1 in that place, that means we're talking about the electron. Now, positron emission is one of two ways to solve our too many proton problems. And what happens in this type of decay is um, a nuclei decays by emitting a positron. A particle is it has the same mass but opposite charge that of an electron. So this is basically the opposite of electron. And really what is happening is a proton is being converted to a neutron in the nucleus, and we kick out the positron. So in a positron emission situation, our atomic number is going to go down by one. So you can see here, atomic number six became atomic number five. So carbon was being converted into boron here. But notice our mass number is not changing because really we just alternated a proton and a neutron. Kind of like the same thing that happened with the beta decay. It's a similar type of idea. But now notice five plus what equals six? It's got to be a one. That's our positron. Be careful. It's not a hydrogen atom because a hydrogen atom has to have something in its nucleus. So it would be one, one right here if it was a hydrogen atom. Well, it's got a zero there. So that's got to be our positron. Now, the other way to accomplish the same thing is to actually capture an electron inside the nucleus, and a proton capturing the electron would then go back to a neutron. And this also helps fix too many uh, protons in the nucleus. So another alternate route to achieve the same result, if we have too many protons, we can also undergo what's called electron or K-capture. So positron emission and K-capture both do the same thing. They help solve the problem of too many protons. So those are our different types of decays that we're going to worry about. Now there is one final decay, it's a gamma emission, but it's not a particle that's coming out. So it doesn't really affect our balancing nuclear reaction situation. It's just energy. So high energy photons emitted. Now most of our decays that we've looked at also have gammas associated with it, but we often don't really worry about them because they're not going to affect our particles in our nuclear reaction. But if you ever see off to the right on the product side, something that looks like this, and if multiple gamma particles are there, you would see how many by the numbers 2, 3, 4, 5, or whatever. And these often associate our other types of emissions. Uh, but we typically ignore them in writing nuclear reactions because without experimental evidence, we have no way of knowing how many gamma particles were also released. So the gamma particle has that um, formula. So this is the symbol for gamma coming off, or I should say gamma rays, not particles. So gamma is not a particle. It's an energy photon that's coming out. Now, a radioactive series is basically a way to describe the sequence of decays that actually happen for something going from something radioactive and eventually becoming stable. Smaller atoms can often undergo one type of radioactive decay to become stable, but larger things like uranium here, in this case, we're looking at uranium-238 because it's U and it's right in that line, the 238 line. Uranium-238 has to undergo a lot of decays to eventually become stable lead-206. So this is what's known as a radioactive series. And large things often do this. They can't just undergo a couple of alphas and be fixed. So they usually undergo a combination of alpha and betas to eventually become stable. So this is an example of what's known as a radioactive series. It's not something that you need to be able to draw. You just need to understand what it's showing here. All those big drops are alphas, and when you're increasing um, and going from, let's say, like right here, TH to PA to U, and making U-234 in this particular case, uh, that's going to be beta to case that you're seeing. Now, next section gets into, because those are natural radioactive processes, unstable nuclei spontaneously decomposing to become more stable. Well, scientists have been able to develop the ability to cause nuclear reactions to happen, and that's nuclear transformation. So a nucleus can change identity if it's struck by a neutron or another nucleus. So if we can hit a nucleus with a particle, we can make the nucleus absorb it or break apart, and we can end up forming a nuclear reaction. And if we induce a nuclear reaction this way, it's known as a 
nuclear transmutation. So we can actually change an atom. We just can't do it in a very controlled way. Now, nuclear transformations can be exuced, uh, introduced or induced by accelerating a particle and colliding it with a nuclide. And that's what our particle accelerators are that you may have heard of. There's a small version of it, but there are very, very large ones. Uh, and this is a picture of a particle accelerator in Europe. That huge circle you see on the map is a gigantic particle accelerator part to accelerate particles to very, very high speeds. And that ends our first set of notes from chapter 21.